Hey guys, and welcome back to Let's Play Musa, or in this case, Lawn. So, it's been a little while since the last release, sorry about that. I've uh, been very busy with Boston and a lot of other stuff happening, I'm graduating pretty soon. So, this video, I'm going to try and make these on average about 30 to 45 minutes from now on. If they go over, oh well, but I tr I'm going to try not to take up too much of your guys' time. By the end of this video, this comet boost will be almost done, if not finished. Now, the topic for this video is one that concerns Black Desert, but also concerns quite a lot of other MMOs, and that is the topic of differences in Western and Eastern gaming. So, there are quite a number of differences in Western and Eastern gaming, and it's these differences that make Eastern ports over to the West um, a rather difficult prospect. There are a lot of games that are ported over to the west from the east. So you've got stuff like Black Desert, Blade and Soul, uh, more recently you've got Bless Online, and a lot of them just don't end up doing well. Like I'm sure everyone can think of at least a few v games that have been ported over uh, that you were excited for at first, and then you started playing and it just it wasn't what you expected. And that's because there's a lot of differences in philosophy between gamers in the West and the East, as well as game developers. So when you think of popular MMOs, to support this point, you generally won't be thinking of Eastern MMOs. Uh, I wish I would use the actual attack here. There we go. You're generally going to think of Western MMOs. Of the popular MMOs that I can think of, uh, going back quite a ways, you've got Ultima Online, EverQuest, RuneScape, World of Warcraft, Guild Wars 1 and 2, EVE Online, Dark Age of Camelot, uh, Elder Scrolls Online, there's quite a few others that I've missed, but these are the big ones, the ones that you name them and people go, oh yeah, I've heard of that MMO, even if they're not really an MMO player. Um, the Eastern games, I would say, have done well in the West. The biggest one would be Final Fantasy XIV, and that one, as everyone knows, it is probably pretty unique among MMOs in that it's the only MMO I can think of that failed on launch, was taken down for an entire year, and then came back to be an actually successful game. Like, uh, most games do not do that. They, they fail, and then they kind of fade into obscurity. Uh, games such as Nine Dragons, for example. So Final Fantasy XIV is probably the most successful, but there's quite a few other successful ones as well. Ragnarok Online, MapleStory, MapleStory is a pretty big one. MapleStory 2 is coming out pretty soon and it's getting fairly good reviews. Uh, obviously, Black Desert Online, Blade and Soul, FlyFF, Terra, Arcage. There, there's a few others as well, but those are the ones that I can name and uh, people will probably go, oh yeah, I've heard of that. FlyFF is more of a little pet game of mine, but it was fairly popular back in the day when it was released, like 2005, 2006. So, as you can see, at least in the West, most of these games are the good ones at least, the ones that received a lot of popular acclaim, and the ones that are still around and are good MMOs, are Western MMOs. And that's because there's quite a lot of differences between Eastern and Western philosophy. So if I was to sum it up, I would sum it up like this. In the West, gameplay focuses on the destination. In the East, it focuses on the journey. So what do I mean by this? Well, when you think of a story, for example, because games are really stories that you yourself are a part of. So when you're thinking of a story, uh, there's usually a couple parts of the story. There's the beginning, the middle, and the end, all that stuff that you learn back in English class. Um, but how long each part lasts and which part uh, emphasizes what is different depending on the story. For an Eastern game, most of the story is going to be about getting stronger, it's going to be about continuously challenging stronger and stronger enemies, um, never really stopping your quest to get stronger, and never really uh, ending anything. You just you keep on leveling up, you keep on challenging bigger and better bosses, and that's the story of the entire game. In Western games, it's a little different. Western games focus more on the destination. They focus more on getting to the end of the story 
and then fighting a big bad boss, uh, and then that is your power level for a long time. Uh, eventually, if they release an expansion, they will upgrade the power level, you'll get a new big bad boss. But it's more about getting to the destination, and then you have the rest of the game to kind of go through. So, the difference is pretty pronounced if you look into it. Eastern games focus more on grinding, they focus more on continuously powering up your character, continuously leveling, continuously gaining new skills. Whereas the West, one, so leveling is over, leveling is over. Yes, you still want to get yourself stronger gear, you're still looking for the legendary sword of so-and-so, or the ancient lich's uh, sacred necklace, but you're not spending more time leveling, you're not spending more time uh, gaining new skills. For the most part, you are kind of done getting stronger yourself. Your character is now mature. You are ready to help the world's problems beyond just the basic fetch quests to help villagers that are in trouble on the on the uh, the journey itself. Once you get to the destination, that's when the real game begins in the West. So. That's it's, it's kind of an oversimplification, honestly, of a fairly deep topic, but there is quite a lot more to look at for Eastern and Western games. That's kind of a basic synopsis. Um, one of the big things that kind of makes ports difficult uh, is both these philosophies and there's a few other things that I'll get into before I go back to the philosophy. So one of the big things is infrastructure. Especially, this is especially true for Korean and Japanese games. Korean especially. Everyone has heard about the incredible Korean internet. If you haven't heard about the incredible Korean internet, Korea, especially, well, South Korea is really what we're talking about, is a tiny peninsula in just off the Pacific Sea to the west of Japan and south of China. So, south and east, really. Uh, it's very small geographically, has a large population. Uh, that is heavily focused in as few small population centers, such as Seoul, and it's got incredible internet infrastructure, as a lot of its infrastructure was built a little later, uh, following the Korean War. So we're, we're talking about 1970s, 80s, and 90s, as Korea went from a farming and agriculture-based... Uh, it was pretty much what we currently consider a third world country, even though, strictly speaking, historically, it was not, as it was associated with... Uh, the West and America, which makes it a first world country, ironically enough. Um, but yeah, it was, it was poor, it was impoverished, uh, most of its uh, inhabitants were focused on agriculture. It was not a great place, honestly. Uh, and this was not really Korea's fault. It, Korea spent centuries under the fist of China, Russia, and Japan. Uh, and right after World War II, right before the Korean War, uh, they just finished being inhabited, um, they were colonized by Japan. So Korea was not in a good state. Uh, and as a result, when they finally started to improve massively, really quickly, they are in fact the uh, poster child for the Korean Tigers along with Japan, or not Korean, sorry, the uh, Asian Tigers, um, which are a group of countries that have massively increased their economy. And I know this is kind of boring, this is uh, very unlike, ungame like but it's kind of important to uh, understand the infrastructure. Um, and thus their infrastructure is much more up to date, and it's focused in a much smaller area than in America. In Korea, you've got a very tiny amount of land, it's probably about the size of like Florida or something, if not a bit smaller. And very good internet, which means Koreans have insane internet, they have like 9 ping. Uh, which means a game developed in Korea by Korean game developers is developed with the idea that everyone is playing on these sorts of pings. Um, then when you port that to the West, so North America, Europe, uh, where you've got maybe a server in Chicago, or a server in Munich, or London, and then people that are in Italy, or people that are in California, or anywhere further away than... Uh, well, then basically a state or a province or a small country in the EU is going to be getting much higher ping, going even further as you get out. In North America and the EU, having 80 to 100 ping in a game is not considered all that terrible. Uh, even recently, like League of Legends, until about season, I want to say season 4, 
I played the game with 90 ping, and that was normal for me. Going up to 100 was still manageable. 110 started to become a little difficult, but that's just how I played the game because the uh, the servers were located in, I want to say like San Francisco, San Diego, something like that, LA. Houston? I, I forget where the servers located. They were moved to Chicago or something like that, which is way better for me. So infrastructure, especially in Korea, is a big one. Uh, when you play games like Blade and Soul, which was basically created as an MMO fighting game, uh, focused around twitch combat, fast combos, fast reaction times, it's difficult to make that type of game work in a region where most of your player base is not going to be able to play at those pings and we'll have to play against people that do have those pings because the people that do have those pings have all the advantage in a game designed around being able to take advantage of having ping that low so that infrastructure is definitely a big one and it's often overlooked uh, a lot of people don't kind of look at infrastructure when they say that a game is bad uh, that was ported from korea or another asian country with uh, great ping because it's not something you consider out in the west it's uh it's just kind of normal that games here have higher ping because you cannot create server and data centers everywhere to appease everyone. For on And there's been a lot of attempts in uh, games, especially in the West recently, to kind of make up for uh, having servers in certain places. For Honor, for example, tried uh, unsuccessfully to do a peer-to-peer -peer system which allowed the players to host the games, but uh, that's a vast oversimplification actually of for Honor system. It was actually pretty in innovative and interesting, um, but unfortunately it did not work out that well and they did recently switch to dedicated servers uh, to the, not detriment, uh, the opposite detriment of the game, to the advantage of the game. So infrastructure, definitely heavily overlooked, but it plays a big part in uh, the reason a lot of Eastern games just aren't as successful. Now, another th reason is the culture. So this kind of goes back to the philosophy. And there's a difference in culture between Asian cultures and Western cultures. Western cultures are more individualistic. They focus more on the individual and succeeding on your own, uh, kind of in spite of the group on a lot of the time. In Eastern cultures, uh, it's the opposite. You are supposed to succeed with the group and be part of the society. If you succeed, the group as a whole succeeds. If you fail, the group as a whole is worse off for your failure. Whereas in the West, you are expected to shoulder the entire blame and results for your failure. In the East, not quite so much. Although you will still, it, it's not like it's appreciated if you fail in the East. It's failing is still considered bad in the East. Um, where, where you can see this a lot, actually, is in gaming. For anyone that follows League of Legends, uh, the Koreans are on top of the world. Chinese are generally considered the second best region. Um, they don't always perform well, but they usually put up fairly good results at Worlds itself and in other international events. Uh, however, in, in the West, we encourage our teams. We, we support uh, Cloud9, TSM, uh, CLG, Team Liquid, wh whoever gets sent. But... When they lose, while we do often meme about them, for example, double lift saving Flash, um, th th there's a lot of memes. I'm not going to go over all of them. Uh, double lift saving Flash would be a big one from uh, the more recent worlds. Uh, however, that's kind of the extent. We, we meme about it, but unless a player has such a terrible performance, uh, we, we kind of get over it. In China and Korea, uh, when the tr comments are translated from Baidu, Tibia, and in Ven, the, if their teams lose, oh my god, they are so much worse than the West. Um, because the failure is seen not as the failure of the team, but the failure of the entire region. And as a result, uh, the team losing is a disgrace to the region themselves. And Asians are a lot, also, the East is also a lot more concerned with honor uh, than the West. But another good example for this is anyone that has worked in customer service or has worked with groups of Asian immigrants. You'll often see Asians especially sending a lot of money back to the family. If you've ever worked at Western Union or gone to a Western Union, Filipinos are probably the biggest uh, sender to the East. They send so much money back. If you manage to immigrate to the East, it's kind of like getting out of being poor or getting out of the ghetto. You're expected to then kind of come back and help out 
your family and friends that are still stuck there. This uh, philosophy does apply to games. In fact, it applies quite a bit. So, basically, how they see games is the West sees them as a battleground where all are equal. The East sees them as more as any advantages you have can be used in the game. Uh, and this applies to MMOs especially because MMOs, um, especially in the West, are known for players wanting to shun pay to win. Guild Wars 2, World of Warcraft, uh, ESO, players campaign as hard as they can against any pay to win mechanics being put in the cash shops or equivalents of the cash shop for these regions. Um, it's the same with the Eastern games that come over. One of the biggest concerns for Black Desert and Blessed, two of the more Eastern, Eastern games that were ported over to the West, was pay to win. Was there going to be pay to win in the cash shop? Because pay to win certainly exists in the East. Uh, in fact, pay to win is very, rather prevalent in the East. So, Bless Online, probably the biggest topic before its release, was will the cash shop contain pay to win? Neowis was saying no, a lot of players were worried that it would be a yes because Bless Online had a lot of pay to win in previous regions, uh, especially pet scrolls and things to do with pets. Um, Black Desert, same thing, and Black Desert, it was both games, they promised there would be no pay to win. Black Desert has obviously since reneged on that promise. Uh, there are quite a few pay to win elements in the cash shop, depending on what you personally see as pay to win. Um, for some people, there's no pay to win elements in the cash shop. For others, most of the cash shop is pay to win. It, it's really all about your point of view there. Uh, Bless Online, not very many yet, but Black Desert, when it released, didn't have any either. So you kind of got to go and wait and see going forward. But pay to win is kind of a way of life in Eastern games. If you've got money in real life, if you're rich, or if you just have enough income to drop a couple hundred dollars on the game every few weeks, uh, and you spend on the game, that's fairly normal. That's uh, it's something that the game developers encourage, and is just kind of accepted there. Uh, another example of an Eastern game that's ported over the West and then uh, died because of pay to win. Uh, fairly recent too, is Archeage. Uh, I'm sure everyone has heard of the Tryon uh, messing that up with Thunderstruck Trees and all that. Especially because Archeage was, before it went full pay to win, a very fun game. It was very innovative, it was sandbox, true sandbox, not just kind of BDOs, um, mostly sandbox. And it was a lot of fun to play. Unfortunately, uh, Archeage Tryon killed it with the pay to win and it died because the West does not like pay to win. Pay to win, what pay to win does is it takes away from a gamer's ability to prove that they are worthy of being a hero kind of, they're worthy of being a main character, that they not, aren't necessarily in life. Uh, pay to win allows for someone that's already winning in real life to translate that to the game. And in the West, they like to see the game as sort of a place where they can prove that they are worthy, they are strong, they're a powerful, talented person, and they are not held back in game the same way they're held back in real life due to circumstances that are not necessarily in their control. In the game, everything is part of your control. You can only blame yourself if you are the one losing. Unless you're playing a team-based game like League of Legends or Overwatch, and then of course it's your team that are the reason you are stuck in ELO Hell. Do not let me say otherwise, you are stuck in ELO Hell because of your team. Not because you missed 9 out of 10 shots on that Farah as Widow. So, the philosophies and cultures really do play a huge part in why Eastern games do not translate well to Western markets, and vice versa too. Um, Western games, because of their focus on the individual, their focus on sort of hero plays, of being the hero of your own story, of everyone having a fair starting point, of everyone being able to catch up. Western games, as a result, do not always appeal to masses in certain places the way they do where they were released. A game can do perfectly well, both West or East, uh, in its home region, and then fail to gain any traction or even be considered bad if ported to the West or even to just another country in the West or East. It's, uh, it's difficult to say how certain cultures or how certain people will, gamers will react to games. Um, it, it's really difficult, honestly, to say if a game's going to do well, uh, west or east. 
Like, there's a lot of games, obviously a game that's got beautiful graphics, great combat, and a good story should do well no matter where it goes. But there are other mechanics, there's other factors at play that can prevent a game from doing well. And obviously the choices of the devs and the publishers can affect it as well. And getting to publishers, that is another big reason for a lot of ports to fail. In a lot of regions, the publishers have a lot of power. Um, it is usually the publisher's choice uh, for items in the cash shop. The publisher gets to choose when content will be released to a region. Uh, they don't have to release content right away. Uh, for example, Kakao, it's often suspected, we obviously can't prove it, that Kakao withholds content from Black Desert until they mess up or until there's a controversial change in the a patch or to the game where they know players are going to react negatively and then release that content then to change play the kind of change the discourse, change what people are talking about, and change how players perceive the game. Because when a player is thinking about if they can do the new content or how they're going to uh, destroy people in a new battle arena or a new game mode, they're not thinking about the pay to win that was just added to the cash shop or how their main class just got absolutely wrecked in the patch notes um, or how another class that just released is so much better than every other class uh, in a blatant money grab. They're not thinking about any of that. They're thinking about the new content for the most part. And those that are still thinking about uh, the grievances start to become the minority as people discuss the new content and discuss the new stuff. This is a sort of a thing that people often suspect Kakao of doing just because it's something Kakao does a lot. Whenever there's big changes to the game or lots of public outcry, um, Kakao will generally announce the new content we've been waiting for a while, comma, Sylv, Mystic, Lawn, uh, will be coming to the game within the next week or month, usually a month at the longest. Uh, you can actually see this recently with the Lawn. Just as everyone was complaining about all the big changes that were happening to all the classes and the crowd control changes, Renown, uh, they announced that after half a year, Lawn was finally going to be released and people started getting hyped about Lawn, and while they're still talking about the uh, uh, other problems, especially because the most recent patch notes once again brought those uh, to the surface with the boss changes, the Lawn definitely managed to head, odd, head off a lot of the discontent about the game. I feel the discontent on the subreddit would be a lot worse if Lawn had not been released when it did. And luckily for them, Lawn is a lot of fun. Like, I'm having so much fun playing Lawn. I cannot wait to hit 56, start getting absolute skills, and grinding at a decent pace. I especially get my uh, twin blades that I should be getting uh, in not too much longer. Uh, it's probably another two weeks to at most three weeks should be the general time frame that uh, we use for getting awakenings on a new class. Uh, where was it? But yeah, so the publisher, they have a lot of power and a bad publisher can really make or break a game. Uh, for those of you familiar with the publisher Area Games, most of their games are blatant cash grabs. They were slated to be the publisher for Bless Online. Uh, there are a few kind of competing reasons as to why Neo has decided to self-publish. The two main ones are Neo has decided to rework combat, uh, at the request of Area Games even. Area Games did not like the combat in Bless Online, it was the main major reason that the game had failed in the other regions, and they wanted it reworked, but Neo has said that to rework it was going to take longer than Area wanted, so Area decided to drop them as the publisher, because Area sticks to various strict deadlines of when they're going to release a game. If they say they're going to release a game at a certain point, they're going to release the game, or they're going to drop the game before release. There is generally very little variance between those two uh, sort of extremes. When uh, they found out that Neowiz wasn't going to be able to make the deadline, they dropped Neowiz as uh, they dropped Bless Online as a game and decided to switch to other games. Now the other idea is that Neowiz decided that Area's track record just wasn't the greatest, and they decided to part ways kind of mutually because Area didn't want to wait for the update to finish, and Neowiz didn't want Area as their publisher anymore. But the publisher, it has a lot of control over the game, and there's not that many good publishers for East to West games. Nexon uh, has published a lot of better known games, but Nexon is a Korean company. Nexon Global is an American company, I believe. 
uh, but it is just the global branch of the Korean Nexon company, which are the original creators and developers of MapleStory. And thus, um, Nexon usually includes quite a bit of pay to win in their games. It is not like Nexon, just because they self-publish, uh, keeps the paid run out of the games like the Western audience would like. There is quite a lot of pay to win in most Nexon games that are ported to the West. So pay to win, it's definitely a big part of why Eastern and Western MMOs are generally not ported over super well. But it's not the only thing. Going back to the philosophies, um, Eastern gamers are, they're more prideful than Western gamers as well. Um, like I said, they'll, they'll support their teams more, but they'll also lay into them even more if they lose. And this kind of continues over to games as well. The successful are venerated, but losers are disparaged and kind of uh, mocked until they're forgotten. And this doesn't. This isn't just in competitive games. For anyone that played RuneScape, uh, do you remember the name Zezima? Zezima, for you, those of you who don't know, was the perennial number one overall in RuneScape for a long time. He had the number one amount of 99 skills. He had the number one amount of experience. He was the number one. No one could take that throne. Um, and people like Zezima in Eastern games are often. They're seen as great, they're heralded. Th this is kind of similar to Western games as well. Western games, they do kind of the same thing. It's not like uh, just because a games, gamers are in the East, they're going to like their uh, gamers a lot more. It's, uh, it's a little more than that. But Eastern gamers are as a whole more prideful. And uh, even though they're less individualistic as a society, they're more prideful in their accomplishments. Um, in the East, they want to succeed. I'd say they have kind of have like a higher desire to succeed, and their culture is much more grindy. It's the best word I can use, grindy, than the Western cultures. Uh, in the East, for example, you'll notice most Eastern games are grinders. Black Desert, for example, right now, all these Let's Plays are just me grinding. Um, it's why it doesn't make a great streaming game, because honestly, it gets kind of boring after a while. Uh, and I don't like grinding that much. I don't mind grinding, like grinding. It's relaxing for a couple of hours, but when a game is only grinding, it can get a little boring. Uh, but Eastern culture is much more into grinding. Grinders, uh, school for in the East is all about grinding. It's all about rote memorization. It's all about memorizing hundreds of facts, hundreds of uh, gram grammar and poetry, all that. And then once you get to university, it becomes a lot easier. But I'm sure anyone that reads manga, or or manga, if that's how I have to say it, or uh, watches anime, or reads novels, has probably heard of the, I'll say trope, but it's fact, um, about Eastern schools, where you'll get into school at 7 or 8 in the morning, and then you'll leave at 4, and you'll go to prep school for another couple of hours, and you get home at 9, and you'll do, you'll do your homework until 11 or 12, and then you go to sleep at 1, uh, 12, 31, and uh, yeah, that's that's your schedule, um, and it's very difficult. It's there's a lot of work involved. Uh, there's a lot of pressure on students to succeed, and there's a lot of uh, suicide actually as a result of it. One of the uh, worst kept secrets in Korean society is the high rate of suicide for students that uh, don't perform up to expectations and let their uh, parents and family down. Which kind of goes back to the whole succeed as a group, fail as a group. Because in the West, if you're failing uh, in school, it's usually assumed to be either because of your shortcomings as a student or the teacher's shortcomings as a teacher. Um, and obviously recently we've been hearing a lot more... Huh, Zark is up. Do I go and do that? Nah, I'll, I'll ignore it. I need to get my wizard a better staff. I need to upgrade that Zark I've got for him. Or just buy them like a duo green or something. Um, uh, obviously, we've been hearing a lot more about helicopter parents blaming the uh, teachers because their uh, darling Timmy couldn't possibly be doing badly in school. He's such a bright young boy. He just uh, the teacher just isn't engaging him. He's bored because the material is too easy, so on and so forth. But uh, it's often assumed to be one of two individuals' faults. In 
uh, the East, it's generally assumed to be the student and their support system. So, so the support system is usually their parents because their parents are expected to provide for their student. They're expected to provide him with him or her with opportunities uh, to go to prep school, to uh, eat properly, to have a balanced uh, diet, a balanced lifestyle. And if the student's doing poorly, it's because they are not being, they're both being lazy uh, and are not smart enough to understand the material, and they're not being provided with the opportunities that they need to uh, succeed. So it's not just the student's fault, it's also the parents and anyone else that supports the student. Um, the teachers are actually often venerated in these. The teachers are highly respected, much more so than the West. They are uh, looked up to. They're usually paid a lot better, too. Um, and teachers are... There's actually story, a lot of stories of teachers being bribed by uh, the parents to kind of look after their kid a bit better, to make sure that their kid succeeds, to give them special attention, all that. So yeah, so uh, it's it's a very different culture, and this uh, this extends to games. They are much more grind-oriented. Uh, it's much more about putting in the work and uh, doing what you have to do to succeed. Not necessarily no matter the cost, but just continuously putting in the work. It's the same with, the, I'm sure a lot of people have also heard of the Japanese salarymen uh, who are expected to get into the get into work uh, exactly on time before their, and on time is defined as before their boss and whoever's the boss is expected to be first in the morning and then they're expected to leave uh, after their boss and once again the boss is expected to set an example and be the last one out at night and not only that, they're expected to then go drinking after work uh, to form relationships with their boss uh, or their boss's bosses. So this creates a sort of culture where you get in super early in the morning, just like the students, you get in so super early in the morning, you get out super late at night, and then you're expected to go drinking until the wee hours of the morning, uh, stumble home for a couple hours of sleep, and then just get right back to it. A friend of you that have Netflix, there's actually a really funny animated series, I think it's a Netflix original, called Agret Suko, about this little, uh, it's this cute little, I want to say it's a uh, red panda, and her, her job is a an office lady, and it's it's actually really funny, um, but it's also a remarkably on the nose criticism of Japanese corporate culture, and this is kind of an example of how the East uh, sees not just gaming but life in general. You are expected to work harder than everyone else, and everyone else is thus expected to work harder than you. Um, those that don't work hard are not expected to be rewarded, and it must be hard, consistent work. It cannot be working hard for a little while and then stopping to reap your rewards. Uh, you've got to consistently keep on working, keep on working hard, never stop, and uh, doing this but benefits both you, uh, brings honor to you, brings honor to your family, and brings honor to society. Kind of like Mulan, you know? Bring honor to us all. That's, uh, that's Eastern culture. And Eastern games are the same. You, you've got to keep grinding, never stop grinding. You've always got to keep grinding. You've always got to keep getting stronger, improving your character. Uh, improving your skills, improving as a player yourself, uh, or you're going to fall behind. You're going to be, uh, you're going to become one of the losers rather than one of the venerated. And in the West, that's not how it is. In the West, it's uh, once you've put in the time, you're expected to start reaping the rewards. You're expected to retire early if you do super well. You're expected to uh, have fun, go out and have fun. Uh, get to spend money on yourself, get to spend money on luxuries, all that, all that stuff. And I, I'm not saying the East doesn't do that, but it's a uh, it's much more prevalent attitude in the West. It's much more about the individual succeeding and uh, doing well for yourself rather than the rest. Um, company loyalty isn't so much a thing in the West. It's more about being loyal to yourself because the companies won't be loyal to you. Why give, why give the company your loyalty when the company is not going to do the same for you? Oh my god, these things stop stun locking me. Most <laughs> well, so annoying thing about farming at low levels is, uh, farming one of those especially, is they'll come over to attack you. And as a result, uh, you, you, you can kind of grab extra monsters that are part of the rotation, but you're not supposed to have done them yet um, before you want to, and kind of get ganged up upon by these uh, big wandering rogue fighters. And it really sucks. Yeah, in the West, it's more like the Ameri for gaming especially, it's more like the American dream. Um, if you work hard and you work smart, you can succeed, and uh, no, no matter what your circumstances are, you can succeed. Gaming in the West is more like the modern version of the American dream, 
work hard, work smart, be uh, good at what you do, um, network well, you know, find a good guild, and uh, you will, uh, or a good team, depending on the game, and you will find success. People will uh, they'll praise you, you'll, you'll be considered good, and you can, uh, you can do it all. And Western Endgame is like that as well. You grind, you grind, you grind, but then once you're done grinding, once you hit max level, you're done grinding. Now you can start grinding for gear, and once you've grinded for gear, you're a, you're a king. You can. It's all about your own player skill level rather than uh, the skill you have at grinding. And I mean, grinding is a skill. Being able to grind all day like uh, Dark Crusader does, that's not something I could do. Oh my god. Uh, my highest character level is just about to hit 60, right? Like, I hate grinding so much. Um, honestly, the Let's Play series has actually made me grind a lot more often, just because I don't grind that much without the Let's Play series. Um, but it's a good thing for me to grind. Uh, I kind of put it off normally. I'm like, oh, I can just life skill. But uh, yeah, gr grinding's a skill. It's just the West prefers player skill, like, uh, you know, highlight reel type skills to be skills, rather than being able to grind for 14, 16 hours a day. Which is, while well, it is a skill in its own right, hard work is definitely a skill in its own right. As someone that kind of coasted through most of school, trust me when I say hard work is uh, is a skill in its own right. Like, I, I was a solid B+, plus, A- minus student for most of my school. Um, and then I, I met Azrael in high school, and she goes, I like smart men. So I decided for my last semester of high school, I'd do homework, because that's when we started dating, last semester of high school. Literally the time between the semesters, right before exams. Um, we started dating actually the day exams ended. And um, <laughs> I, went, I went from a 75 average to a 96 average uh, just because I started doing my homework. I didn't do anything else. I didn't review. I didn't uh, study or anything. I, I literally just did my homework, which is a form of studying. Um, but yeah, it's, it's not something I, I was able to force myself to do regularly afterwards. I probably should have tried harder in university. Uh, in university, I actually went below a B plus average. I went to about a C plus average, C plus to B minus. So, yeah, it's hard work, it's certainly a skill, but it's not what gamers in the West revere. Hard work is not as revered in the West as it is in the East. Uh, in the West, we prefer flashier, sort of like top-tier talents type skills, like those that would make it into the NBA or the NHL, the people that are one in a million or one in a hundred thousand type skills, not the people that uh, are one in a million for hard work but uh, don't have as much skill when it comes to actually playing the game. Now, of course, it can be that you have both a hard-working skill and um, sort of like flashy mechanical skill, but it's generally rare. And not, honestly, because hard work is sort of a skill that can be trained, it's one of the advantages the East has in competitive esports. Uh, the reason Korea, the reason... Uh, China recently have been doing a lot better in most esports, with the exception of like FPS shooters, is because they are better at sort of working all day, every day towards becoming better players. Not just grinding the ranked ladder like uh, a lot of Western gamers do, but work uh, grinding out scrim scrims as a team, grinding out uh, proper training, like doing actual uh, focused training to improve skills and just kind of generally working harder than the Western teams are known for. Um, now, obviously, this is not a true for every sport. Uh, for example, Dota 2, a lot of European teams have often done well, historically. Um, i trying to think of other good examples. Counter-Strike, for example, is dominated mostly by EU. Um, but then again, Counter-Strike is not the first-person shooter of choice in Asia. The first-person shooter of choice in Asia is actually Crossfire. So it's, it's a little different. But yeah, so there are a lot of reasons that Eastern and Western cultures are kind of different uh, gaming-wise, and those reasons all affect why Eastern ports to the West and Western ports to the East don't generally succeed, despite the huge amount of them. Uh, no matter how many um, there are, it's hard to kind of change everything that makes a game good in the East or in the West and make it loved in the other region. Now, certain games do succeed, but usually these games succeed because they are such amazing games. Black Desert certainly isn't succeeding in the West because people love grinding for six hours a day to be on top. It's succeeding in the West because it brings something that the West has been lacking, and that is a game where you can continually get stronger 
and a game with beautiful graphics. Like, oh my god, Black Desert has got beautiful graphics. Plus the ability to play all day and continuously improve, like I said earlier. Um, the ability to play all day, AFKing, uh, and always getting stronger because of it, is a certain, certainly a draw for Black Desert. If Bless succeeds, I feel it'll probably succeed because it's been a long time since we last got a traditional MMO released. Uh, it's been a long time since uh, an MMO that kind of focused on the basics, kind of like World of Warcraft was released. And as much as people shit on Bless's graphics, Bless's graphics aren't that bad. Bless's graphics are pretty nice. Um, comparatively to a lot of the current MMOs that exist, because a lot of the MMOs that exist right now are actually much older. Uh, and kind of survive off nostalgia and sunk cost fallacy. You cannot honestly look at me and say that World of Warcraft's graphics are amazing. They might be stylized, but just look at the character graphics for the humans or the orcs, and you'll probably start to cringe. It's 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 not great. It's I like the graphics myself. Like I've, I'm gonna go back to World of Warcraft for Battle for Azeroth, but the graphics could certainly use some updating to match with modern standards. Um, for an example of stylized graphics done really nicely, Overwatch, by, also by Blizzard, has really beautiful stylized graphics. Um, they're cartoony, but they're cartoony in the right ways, and it, it's kind of like stylized graphics done well. But yeah, so lots of differences, lots of uh, reasons. Black Desert, yeah, uh, beautiful graphics, um, the ability to play all day, continuously get better. Um, not that Western gamers love grinding, but we were kind of missing a game where you could grind uh, to get better. Uh, there were, I don't want to say the death of certain games, but with a lot of the more prevalent MMOs starting to kind of die off in recent years, uh, Terra, I don't think of other ones. The original Guild Wars died off quite a long time ago, but that was never a grinder. Original Guild Wars, you hit level 20 fairly easily. Um, honestly, there's not that many MMOs these days is the problem, right? Like, the successful MMOs, uh, you can probably count them on two hands. They're that, they're that small a number. I would include Black Desert among those, that number, but certainly it's not like there's a, a huge amount of MMOs right now to choose from if you want a good MMO. But yeah, Eastern and Western uh, gamers, they have different philosophies. Eastern and Western uh, game development companies thus also have different philosophies. Uh, what works in the East doesn't necessarily work in the West, and vice versa. It takes either an incredible game or a game that includes elements that are sort of appreciated in both cultures to succeed, or a game that is so innovative um, that everyone wants to play it anyways. Uh, League of Legends might not have been innovative, but people have been wanting an official version of Dota forever, and League of Legends does it probably the best, uh, or at least with the most widescreen casual appeal that also has competitive appeal, because Heroes of the Storm is certainly more casual than League of Legends, but it's kind of too casual, and it was a little bit of a too little, too late sort of deal. But yeah, so lots of reasons that uh, ports don't always work. Um, Bless, I will be definitely keeping an eye on to see if it works. Black Desert, it it fills a niche, it's a beautiful game, um, and it's certainly working for now, but the greedier that Cacao and Pearl Abyss get, uh, the more danger it's in, and the more they mess with the game, really, the more danger it's in. Like, obviously the game, it's not perfect, I've made plenty of videos disparaging certain parts of the game, such as the gear disparity, uh, the way they balance classes and whatnot, but in the recent month and a half, it's, uh, <laughs> they pissed a lot of people off, so it'll be interesting to see how they kind of bring players back, uh, make players feel appreciated again, make the players feel like they have their best interests in heart, at heart, and they're not just trying to uh, do a few quick, a few more quick cash grabs through rerolls before uh, the game shuts down, or just kind of slowly starts, slowly starts to shut down. I don't expect it to shut down right away, but I do expect them to kind of start slowing down content releases, especially because Pearl Abyss. They are seeing, they're making new MMOs, and they're seeing the mobile version of Black Desert is actually a lot more successful than the PC version, despite its later release. So, it'll be interesting to see how Black Desert does in the upcoming months and years. Um, other Eastern MMOs, there's not that many others that are super successful. Blade and Soul does not have a huge following right now. Um, there's not that many players that play Blade and Soul. It's a very fun game, but it's kind of hamstrung by the ping problems that I mentioned earlier. 
that uh, honestly quite a lot of brawlers and fighting games that are, sort of online fighting games that are released in North America and Europe face. Uh, Absolver is another one that uh, I love the game. I go back to play it every couple months, but it uh, every once I get a few matches where the ping is just out of whack and uh, players are not necessarily teleporting, but their moves are coming up faster than I can react, uh, I start to realize why I put it down again. And yeah. Anyways, um, I enjoy Eastern games. Like, there, there's definitely something to be said for just kind of zoning out your mind and grinding, right? Like, the reason I can make these sort of Let's Plays and not really pay too much attention is because grinding is, it's sort of like a shut off your brain style play. You don't need to think, you don't need to uh, always be on guard like you do when uh, doing PvP or something like that. Uh, League of Legends, for example, you're always on guard. You're always thinking, okay, what's my opponent going to do? What am, what's my next move? Um, Overwatch, shorter, ma shorter uh, matches, but it's kind of the same thing. You've always got to be aiming. You've always got to be thinking. And there's something to be said for just shutting off your brain and grinding. It's uh, it's relaxing. It's fun. And as much as I uh, I kind of talk shit about Eastern MO philosophy sometimes, um, it, it can be nice to be able to just pay a bit of money and kind of catch up without having to spend a lot of time, which Western MMOs have certainly realized recently, uh, not just recently, but in the past few years, World of Warcraft offers character uh, sort of level tokens to get yourself to max level these days. I want to say Guild Wars 2 offers something similar. Guild Wars 2, you can just convert your money to gems and uh, then level up professions to get 80 within a, like an hour, um, or at least you could the last time I played, but that was before the expansions. Um, other games are similar, like you, you don't really need to worry too much about, uh, Western games, like they're, they're starting to realize paying for convenience is a good idea. They, it's just kind of, it's a slippery slope because paying for convenience is great until that convenience becomes winning. When convenience becomes the ability to win, like in Black Desert, where if you don't pay for the convenience of pets and, uh, extra lodgings and inventory, you're going to be making significantly less silver than other players, and as a result, you'll have significantly worse gear, and as a result, you'll win a lot less. So, it is a slippery slope, but there is something to be said for Eastern MMO philosophies. They are a lot of fun. I've played them for over a decade now, um, since middle school, which was well over a decade now, which is kind of scary. And, uh, yeah, it's, uh, I like Eastern MMOs. They're, they're fun. They're, uh, they're usually not too complicated, and they're, they're a good way to kind of shut off your brain between uh, more intensive games like League of Legends, Overwatch, and Fighters. Of course, that's not to say Eastern MMOs are brain dead. Like, go into PvP and Blade and Soul, uh, have an have a intensive node war where uh, both guilds are fairly the same, so it actually comes down to tactics and uh, strategies. And you'll realize that Eastern games can be just as tactical and intensive as Western. It's just the majority of normal gameplay is fairly simple, and that's uh, that's not a bad thing. Anyways, guys, um, as always, thanks for watching. I'm gonna cut the uh, let's play off here. Um, the next episode, I, I'm gonna try and go back to releasing these on Thursday nights, kind of Friday morning type things. Uh, so yeah, as always, thanks for watching. Um, Subscribe if you like it and have a good one. Oh, right. And I, uh, I released a Patreon. <laughs> I know it's probably not going to get any uh, patrons, but uh, yeah, I finally, finally did that. So yeah, have a good one, guys.